Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, you probably um, noticed that the song was in French. It's a very famous um, song about uh, my country, it's winter. Um, and, and it's a very Canadian song. Uh, but, but the reason I chose it is it was really um, one of those interesting examples of where the writer didn't intend for it to be a symbol of separatism, but became, it became a separatist anthem. Um, because of its catchiness and catchy tune. And, and if you ever spent time in Quebec, you had to learn the words to Montpellier. Um, and and um, it's talking about the sentiment of living in a cold country and, and how you survive. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about what it was like to be a public servant in that cold country and surviving. And, and you have to understand some of my history, um, and, and I'll just do a potted version. I spent about 20 years in the Canadian government. I was an operational officer in customs, um, and then I um, moved over to the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade as a trade commissioner. And then eventually I was assigned to the Defense Agency. So I, I want to talk to you um, a little bit of today about how I learned to think in time by uh, working in some of those departments. And, and I'll also throw in um, probably one of my most interesting um, aspects of learning how to deal with stakeholders from something I did for 18 months for CSIRO. So I just want to start with um, what I do. I, I, I'm not in the innovation space per se. But a lot of what I will say is just using different language to express the same things that speakers this morning expressed. And so the space that I work in is in strategy, strategic thinking, strategic planning, strategic um, uh, management, and strategic foresight. So I do everything from help people write strategic plans to doing uh, scenario planning. And I just want to say that when you're working in government, one of the things you have to get in your mind is because we do work over long periods of time, we have to lift our heads above the short term and we have to predict, not in the sense of being accurate, but we have to predict for people who are making decisions, for decision makers. And so we have to project into the future or think about the future and what might be in the future and how we might harness the future or create the future um, and shape it in a way that we arm those people who actually make decisions in government um, in a way that they make better judgment calls. Because when you're talking about the future, there are no facts, and we know that the future will not be the same as the present or the past. So I wanted to start talking about foreign affairs. This was my second department. And I'd spent about six years previously in the customs department doing anti-dumping investigations and valuation work. So kind of um, collecting money for the Canadian government. Um, and when I went to foreign affairs, the first thing I did was administer a quota section. Um, and then I um, was um, given the opportunity because of the times and the change of the time to help with the Canada-US free trade agreement negotiation. And that was um, a, a, a real opportunity which I jumped at. Um, I think a lot of people probably didn't jump at it. And you have to remember that innovation starts with individual will, um, as does strategic thinking. But I think the reason that a lot of people didn't jump at the opportunity is it was a lot of work. And so I ended up doing analysis in support of a really impressive man named Pierre Gosselin. And Pierre had what I call canny judgment. Um, and my analysis was on broiler hatching eggs, footwear, and automotive parts. So um, you can see how there's connections between all three. Um, <laughs> you know, it was, it was a time where we were um, starting to enjoy the peace dividend. So the government decided that um, we were cutting back um, the, the size of the bureaucracy in Canada. So we kind of um, became Jills and Jacks of, of, of trade. So um, I worked in this building for about seven years. And, and the first part of it was doing a bit of quota administration. Um, and, and the second part of it 
was working on the Canada-US free trade agreement. And it was one of the first ever free trade agreements that the United States had negotiated. And my job was to do analysis that would arm Pierre um, to make judgments on his feet during negotiations. And the one thing that I noticed about Pierre, and this is probably the really impressive thing I noticed about him. Well, there's probably a couple of things. One is even though I was an analytical log, he let me sit as a fly in the wall in the back of the, the meeting. So I think sometimes um, the way we think and, and our skills at thinking and our ability to be um, strategic in our thinking um, and, and innovative or creative is that we're mentored a bit. And so I think what happened with Pierre, like myself, and a, and a couple of other uh, of the analysts to sit in the back, and, and he had this capacity to think in time. And he would be able to draw on the long history or the past of things, but he would also marry that with an ability to forecast what might be. And I think that um, what is and what ought to be or what might be, because there's different states, was the thing that I probably took most away from Pierre. Um, his judgment was excellent, and you would see him make judgment calls on the run during the negotiations. And that probably, the reason I put that up is that that sparked my interest, and it's a lifelong interest, and, and I've done it in many ways and shapes and forms since, in how people make good judgment calls. And that's what I'm particularly interested in, and, and, and how they make good judgment calls when they're in a condition of uncertainty or ambiguity. Um, there, there's a lack of clarity. And, and I think part of um, innovation, to me, and remember I'm not in this space, but part of it is that ability to make judgment calls about what is feasible or doable. And that's what I saw Pierre um, do. And it gets back or harks back or, or um, is reminiscent of a couple of the comments that um, the two previous speakers meant that good thinking or good ideas are useless unless you can ask, ask and answer the question, what will work on the ground? And, and if you don't ask and answer that question, what will work on the ground? It might be a prototype, it might be a pilot, but you have to try to, try to deliver something workable. And so um, I thank Pierre for, for sparking my interest in um, um, thinking in time thinking what is doable in the present, but how that might play out over time if I implement that. And, and I think the next slide that I want to talk about is, uh, if you go forward um, a few years, is uh, when I had the opportunity to work for CSIRO. Um, when I moved to Australia uh, permanently, I was here on a posting for a while, I went home, took a voluntary redundancy, and moved back right away. Um, one of the things that you want to think about is I was given one of the first engagements was by the energy flagship in CSIRO. And um, what, we, what they asked me to do was to take a hodgepodge of people who had agreed to fund a study on the future of energy. And they asked me to get the Pisana report. And I thought, no sweat until I walked into the room the first day. Because the room had Rio Tinto and BHP in corner one, and the Australian Conservation Foundation and the World Wildlife Federation in corner two. And, um, you know, I thought about that assignment a lot because we put out a report called The Heat Is On, and you can still see it on the CSIRO website, but it was a pretty bland report. So I thought, what did the contract actually ask me to do? What was the product that I was asked to deliver? And in my judgment call, it was about an EL1, EL2 job. They just didn't have people, so they contracted it out to somebody to facilitate meetings over an 18-month period and get a report written that everybody in the room would agree to sign. And, and I thought about it, and I thought, my job was to take people with different perspectives and keep them in a room long enough 
that they could figure out where each other was willing to compromise and they could sign a report. That was my initial thinking about it, but I think that's rather lawyerly because that assumes that somebody in the room doesn't have facts and if you give them enough facts, they're going to compromise a bit. Um, and, and when I thought about it again, I thought, well, really, what the contractor was asking me to do was to put a room full of strange bedfellows together and to realize that there were some areas where they would have no common interest, but to put them together so I could get a better range of views for CSIRO on different solutions and how to frame the problem. And that's, I think, what, what often what you have to do. And, you know, Alan had been speaking, um, one of the previous speakers spoke, spoke about the art of brainstorming. And when you look at writers that talk about 21st century leadership, one of the key questions that they ask is, can you work with people that are very different with you from you it might be a difference in language, it might be a difference in um, uh, world views, it might be physical differences, it might be cultural differences. But can you work with people who are very different than you to achieve a goal? And I think that's what CSIRO was trying to do in the mid-2000s. And, and it was a good lesson for me because that was probably one of the most complex um, stakeholder engagement processes. And I'm going to come back to that point about 21st century leadership very shortly. So just bear in mind that one of the features of 21st century leadership is the ability to effectively use forecasts that are highly uncertain. The second is <laughs> the idea of working collaboratively with people with whom you disagree. And the third, is probably this story. So this is the defense headquarters in Ottawa, and it sits over um, the, the Rideau Canal. And the funny story about when it was um, built, or when defense occupied it, is the city planners allowed the Russian embassy up the hill to build a new building there. And you can imagine that they didn't have the secure, they had to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to um, make secure communication areas. Um, but at Defense, um, I work for a gentleman named Ray Sturgeon. And Ray Sturgeon was, to put it kindly, uh, very gruff. Um, and and his, he and I did not get along. But what I learned from Ray was quite interesting. Ray had a personal or a worldview that breakthroughs or making breakthroughs don't come from ordinary thinking. And what he looked for all the time was new ideas. And we would have some pretty heated arguments sometimes. And he had this habit of being able to quote to me, file volume blah from 10 years ago, look on the right hand side of the page and he remembered the detail. So he could always out detail me. And I don't like details myself personally, but I did learn something about the importance of balancing a breadth of understanding with detail. And I think one of the things we forget about big ideas or great ideas that have to get in, in, innovated is what you're looking for sometimes are the gem of an idea that you can exploit. And um, Henry Mintzberg, and, and I'll come back to him a bit later as well, often says that you seeing above and seeing below is how you are strategic. But he says disregard the sense of seeing above. Seeing the big picture is not what you should be looking for. If you're being really strategic and you're trying to find something new that will help you better position yourself for the future as an organization, you have to find the diamonds in the rough. 
He said, you have to have people who can discern that this little area is where you're going to work to have the most success. And so Ray um, was really difficult to work with. And I, I thought I'd known him after a couple of years. But then we had, um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and it was a really exciting time in the Canadian government because we're sort of the Boy Scouts of the world. Um, we want everybody um, to, to enjoy the peace dividend. And of course, our military spending is conditioned on the fact that the US, our neighbor, is the biggest military spender in the world, so we don't have to spend as much. And, and, and one of the really interesting things about Ray was he let me do something that I was told would never happen. So we've gone over to Russia after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the Russian law said that if you were um, a senior non-commissioned officer in a bomb in the military, they could not make you redundant unless they gave you a house or an apartment. And so on the flight back, I, I said to Ray, why don't we teach them how to make houses? Because that was their central problem. They could not demobilize a large number of the military. And I said, why don't we make, teach them to make houses? And in the end, that's what we did. We got 13 private sector and government organizations together. And we said, they need to know how to write a mortgage, how to borrow money, how to make houses out of wood because they had these old East German cement contraptions of apartments going up all over the place. And, and so we built a sawmill in Siberia. We sent the Canadian military engineers over to work with military engineers, the first 10. And we said, here, here's 10 of you. We're going to teach you 10 how to set up a company, how to write a mortgage, and how to build a house. We're going to give you all those facilities, and then you, in turn, each of you teaches 10. And that's what happened. And, and we were successful in helping demobilize um, the Russian military um, to some extent. Um, and, and I think that was probably one of the most interesting things, because here was a difficult man who didn't really like me. We knew we had a bit of a personality clash. And yet he recognized a gem of an idea, and he supported me. And you don't, I can't tell you how many military officers I dealt with over the time, you know, colonels and generals who said it will never happen. And that's the other point is, not only do you have to have people with a great idea, you have people who say, yeah, you think it will never happen, it will happen. You have to have people who can navigate through difficult organizational waters. And I just thought that those three kind of um, ideas are, are quite instructive. You know, as I said, I don't work in the innovation space, but I thought I wanted to share with you the fact that innovation has been happening for years. Innovation happens when you're under fiscal pressure. Innovation happens when big crises, you know, and you have to have that smell of smoke in the nostrils often makes innovation easier. And one of the, the tips people make is if you're in a situation like the Australian Commonwealth Public Services right now, it's ripe for innovation, and people will listen to good ideas, and they will listen to things. They won't come back with, it ain't broke, don't fix it. And they won't come back with, we don't have money, because they know that the lack of money drives innovation. So those were kind of my three stories. And I wanted to kind of segue to, I'm not, I, I didn't even try to play the film clip uh, this morning. So this woman is from Boston Consulting Group, and her name is Rosalind um, Torres. And in late 2013, she gave a speech on 21st century leadership. It's her passion. And it's a lovely little speech, and I commend it to you. But I'm going to do exactly what the last speaker said, and, except I, I actually wrote it out a bit. She says, forget professional development programs. You know, we send you away for three days to wherever, or we send you for a day to wherever. If you're not being fully funded, take the reins of the horse in your own hands and ask and answer these questions. So the first question is, 
Where are you looking to anticipate the next change? She's talking about something that we've said for 30 years and it's come, coming to fruition. I just remind you how long did it talk, take to knock down the smoking rates in Australia? 20 some years. Things take time. You know, the seeds, and, and, and we saw that sort of that flat line before you go up the S curve, that exponential. And, and I think what was really interesting was anticipate is what I love to think about. It's kind of a weird thing, probably. But I like to think about how can you tell, what are the early signs of change? And she's basically saying, can you anticipate change in your business model? Can you anticipate change in your life? And, um, you, you know, there are ways um, to look for early signs of change. And I commend to you any search engine and type in the word horizon scanning. Now, it's going to talk about a formal process but you can do the same things as an individual. And the easiest way to spot change early is to have that sense of something does not fit. And a lot of people spot anomalies or things that don't fit. And then you have to say, what am I going to do about that thing that doesn't fit? And that's what you're looking for. <coughs> The second point sort of harks back to the CSIRO um, that Rosalind made. The second point is, what is the diversity measure of your network? And she talks about working with people who you might not normally work with. And in fact, she says, often you have to form alliances with totally new groups to get something new done. And she talks about that ability to have people trust you enough to work towards a and, and I think that's, that's something we forget. To me, trust in government, I define, and, and trust, you know, in forming those little communities of practice are founded on three things. Being reliable, being competent, and being honest. And so, um, you want to think about how you form or work with a stakeholder and how broad your stakeholder network. And the third point, Parks back to that earlier thing, it ain't drug dump fix. You must be willing to stop or abandon things that you've spent a lot of time build, building up. And remember that some things that have made you successful in the past are not workable in the medium to long term. So you must be willing to abandon things. So she said, if you ask and answer yourself those three questions, You've just given yourself an MBA from Harvard. And that's what you should learn. That's what a 21st century leader should be. Um, I just wanted to talk a bit about my personal experience and kind of sum it up in terms of uh, this Torres um, film clip. And I'm going to talk now about toolkits. You remember Alan talked about toolkits. Um, the first thing that I say to people about toolkits is, I like tools uh, because they help you start the right conversation. You abandon them if they divert the conversation. But tools can often be translated into simple questions. And so I want to talk about two books that, that talk about, are surprises predictable or not? So the first, uh, Bazerman and Watkins wrote a book. And they said, most organizations fail because they didn't anticipate a surprise that they should have seen coming. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but a few governments around the world are now being sued for things they should have seen coming. <laughs> so that ability to take government to court for what they should have known is kind of an interesting development over the last few years. And, 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 um, um, I just put that in as a side. So Predictable Surprises is really a book about more corporate failures, but they talk about a risk management questions, which I'll show you very shortly. And then the second book is called The Art of Public Strategy. You know, I couldn't get a cover shot as well. And it was by Jeff Mulgan. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the name, Jeff Mulgan, ran the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit 
in the United Kingdom under David Cameron for quite some years. And in fact, we liked the strategy unit so much that Peter Jennings, when he was a Prime Minister in Cabinet here in, in, the, in uh, Canberra, stole the idea and we set up our own strategy unit. Anyways, Jeff wrote one of the very few books. If you look at the literature, there's only about 300 articles over the last 15 years on strategy in the public sector. And Jeff has written one of the few books that has been written. And, and Jeff talks about predictable failure or predictable mistakes government makes. So I'm going to just flip to the next slide. And I'll talk to you about first about uh, uh, Bazerman and Watkins. He said, you can be blamed, and you should rightly be held accountable if you answer um, any of these questions, um, did you recognize the threat when you should have? Did you prioritize it appropriately, i.e. did it move up the list? Did you mobilize effectively, i.e. did you spend money once the threat was recognized? It's a good little book, but I don't think it's probably anything foreign that any of you have done risk management would do. On the other column, um, I, I think that's probably worth a bit more of a, a talk, and this is Jeff Mulgan's take on why governments fail. And, and, and I think it's really interesting because if, if this is why governments fail, um, maybe we can think about how to correct or, or solve problems before they happen. So the first he said is empathy. They are unable, government is unable to put itself in the shoes of the public it serves. And it might be a small slice of the public or a bigger slice of the, the public. You know, the story about the police, um, you know, going into um, your police reception and just getting a machine, I found very fascinating because I was thinking, what are we doing in Centrelink? We're becoming totally digital where it's almost impossible to talk to people. And, and, and when do we need to have access to people? What type of traumatic or personally um, difficult situations do we need to have face-to-face -face contact with? I'm not sure of Centrelink strategy, but um, I think there are good reasons and bad. The second he talked about is investment psychology. And basically he said government is a victim of the sunk cost effect. We spend so much money, we're not willing to give it up. And I just want to briefly highlight two stories, well maybe one and a half, submarines. How long did it take us to make the, sub, the Collins class submarine workable? You know, when we, we, we decided, it, it took us years to make it workable. We spent billions of dollars when we could have, with the corrected money, bought a completely workable submarine. And so at some point, somebody was unwilling to abandon it. There are reasons for and against, in fact, in the weekend paper, somebody was um, talking about um, the issue about whether we should build submarines again or not. The second one I want to talk about, just in terms of investment psychology, was, is anybody from Austrade today? Because Austrade, a few years back, tried to set up a secure communication system with the posts. And one of the really interesting things about it is they talked about, um, um, they did it for 18 months and they realized it would never work, not without doubling or tripling the spend. So they started from scratch. They threw out what they had and they started from scratch and ended up 18 months later with a successful spend. Stanford University has a policy, every so often they freeze all IT spending because people start doing little tweaks and they start doing um, inconsistent software and things like that. So they freeze the money, take the average over three or five years and then buy an entirely new system for the university. Wishful thinking. Um, wishful thinking is usually we think things are going to stay the same as they are today. And, and, and Jeff Mulgan goes on um, to elaborate um, that thinking is 
straight line trends, the population will be pretty well the, the same. His fourth or his third area, a fourth area of, of failure, what causes failure in government is we don't understand runaway and dynamic processes. And if you remember the second John this morning talked about um, um, systems thinking and the ability, um, the cup, but, but the ability that, you know, it was the lily pad example you probably all heard, you know, when things are changing exponentially, suddenly a river will be healthy one day and it seems the next day it collapses. And so those kind of um, examples, the lily pad example, if you start with two lily pads and it's growing exponentially, how many days does it take the pond to be covered? So, so this idea that we don't understand, and I think if you think about some of the use of social media in the Middle East, that's probably a good example of a runaway process. You know, how could the government respond? How could the government understand? And then he says, Jeff says, the next thing that we don't understand is normal probability. So if you think about a distribution curve, a normal distribution curve, <clears throat> His point is extremes are very much more likely than we think working at the extreme. And he talks in his book, he talks about evil personalities or evil people in society as an extreme example. Um, the next point about continuing is with assumptions that happen to be wrong is an entire field of study. It's called assumption-based learning. And, and one of the things we do with the strategy area is we look at what we believe to be true about the future and what we build into our plans based on our beliefs and we question which ones are weak, which ones might collapse in the forecast period. And, and so assumptions and testing assumptions, and the easiest way to test assumptions <coughs> is to put somebody who disagrees with you in the room. Just walk down the hall, and if you're a bunch of social workers, walk down the hall to that economist because they're going to tell you you don't have a schmick about understanding this, whatever the issue is. Um, the last two he added, I think, near the end of writing his book, is an ability to make difficult trade-offs. I'm not quite sure, um, you know, it seemed like a throwaway line. And then he said when there was a lot of political turmoil or instability or minority government, that governments tended to ignore truths that are too difficult to uh, absorb. You know that old saying, speaking truth to power. Sometimes um, he's saying, don't speak truth. So I just thought that was an interesting list if, if we're looking at innovation about solving problems, and this is where failure comes from. It's kind of an interesting <clears throat> little list from somebody who's very well experienced. And I don't know if you, you, you're aware, but Jeff Mulgan just spent a year with the South Australian government and has been starting the rounds in Canberra about offering his service. But he, he, he's kind of an interesting gentleman to talk to. So um, when we think about um, what I've said so far, I've, I've kind of um, said, well, think about being your own leadership developer. Think about developing your own um, skills. Now think about where you could apply them, which is areas of failure. And I want to talk about uh, a couple of things that um, this leads to. Um, if we take a pause, you have to develop to an, innovate, uh, an ability to focus on what matters most. Identify those points of intervention or points where you generate options to act that have the biggest bang for the buck. They create flow on or ripple or knock on effects, whatever you want to call it. But it's this idea of a skipping stone effect. You, you throw a stone out and it can plunk, so you're spending money not as wisely. And what you want to think about is if you can skip stones on a lake. The second point is... Don't be afraid to anticipate. You should put forward ideas that address emerging issues and emerging problems before there is quantitative proof that those issues or problems um, exist. If nothing else, they might 
ignore your great idea, but put forward those issues. I have noticed this. I have been talking to this central stakeholder, and they're saying this. They might be going bankrupt. They might be doing whatever. And what you want to think about is anticipation is causing, at the very least, rehearsal in people's minds. So it's not a complete shock or surprise. So your job, remember, I said at the very beginning, is to arm decision makers to make better judgments. Don't get trapped in the present. Think beyond, we make this decision and here's how people react. What happens after that? How can I course correct and adjust to get to where I really want to be or the best possible position in the future? So you almost have to think over three time horizons. And somebody this morning, I can't remember who, was talking about complacency. So assumptions, which are things we believe to be true about the future, uh, are things we take for granted. And, and, and it's very easy to take things for granted um, or being complacent. And that's probably a, a very dangerous space to be in, which most of you are well aware of. So that was kind of my preamble to giving you my two favorite tools, because I like building toolkits. Um, um, well, three favorite tools, I guess. I want to talk about three favorite tools that help helped me a lot in think through what is the problem? Where are we today? What possibilities do we face and what do we want to do about it? Those are kind of things that I think about when I'm given a new assignment. And you know, as, as a small um, consultancy, um, and, and, and I teach strategic thinking broadly across the public sector, um, one of the things that I often talk about is I feel like I'm about an EL too. I get problems that clients want solved, and, and I get new ideas they want implemented. So um, a strategy guru, Henry Minsberg, talks about strategy not as planning or as management, but as a way of seeing the world. So he defines strategic thinking as a way of seeing. And this has helped me, and it's a, a good little memory jogger. He has two couplets, see ahead and see behind. So much like Pierre um, Gosselin did, he says, take history and understand where things have come from, understand their development path. Because unless you understand that, you won't understand the way people think that you're dealing with. But Mintzberg emphasizes seeing ahead is not about <coughs> projecting in the traditional sense, it's about seeing disruption or discourse. How will the future be different than the past? And that's probably far more critical um, in Mintzberg's mind. Seeing above and seeing below. Uh, I alluded to that earlier. And seeing above is all of the stuff you hear, like take a helicopter view, see the big picture. And Mintzberg discounts that. He says that's not so much important as your ability to find the place to intervene or to act. Where do I put pressure? What levers do I have? And he says that requires understanding detail and sorting through sort of the noise from the signal. See beside is your ability, like Rosalind Torres was talking about, is your ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. It's lateral thinking. See beyond is different than see ahead because see beyond is where your creativity can and he talks about the capacity <coughs> to envisage a better world. And remember, her strategy is about making things better. You know, if you're going to spend money on being strategic, or if you're going to spend money on being innovative, the purpose is, is to be better, to better position yourself. Um, see it through is the point that every speaker made this morning. Great ideas are great but they're worthless if you don't have a doability test in your mind. How am I going to get this through? So that's kind of my first tool, and it's just really a little memory jogger. If you get something, um, think about where are we today? What possibilities do we play? I guess the subheading of where are we today is how might this play out in time? 
um, what possibilities do we face and what do we want to do about it? And that's a pretty good strategic thinking process that's probably relevant to most innovators. The second thing I want to talk about is this concept of three horizons thinking. Now, this is a tool I often use with organizations to talk about past, present, and future, and um, how to use it intelligently. Um, so, I'm going to start with, um, usually when you see three horizons, just envisage three columns, horizon one, horizon two, and horizon three. That's what you put on the sheet. Horizon one is the present. And horizon one means what's happening now plus the immediate reaction to your decisions that you're making. So it's not just your decision, it's kind of that immediate after reaction. And you always, if you're going to be creative, you always do horizon one first and horizon three second. Horizon three is about where you want to be plus what happens to you. And so one of the things you have to think about is part of the strategy is about positioning yourself to be resilient, and the other part of the strategy is about creating the future you want. So you do horizon one, horizon three, and then you do horizon two. And in my experience, most organizations talk well about horizon one and two, but they don't do horizon or, or, and three, but they don't do horizon two. Horizon two is a very complex what if or if then thinking that's required. It's a series of hypotheses about how you can course correct what might happen and then how you can course correct or adjust what might happen. Um, Bill Sharp has just written a, a book um, from the UK. It was published in 2014 on Three Horizons Thinking. I think when I think about Three Horizons Thinking, it just reminds us in government, when we're giving advice to decision makers, we cannot be short term. And we must anticipate that things won't quite go to plan because as soon as you write a plan, it's out of scale. So how are we going to course correct or adjust? And that will help you have the right people, the right capabilities, the right resources to make those adjustments. You should not be surprised that once something is introduced, it doesn't quite go to plan. And, and I think that addresses a lot of the um, issues or types of failure that Jack Morgan was talking about in his book, The Art of Public Strategy. So my first tool um, was Henry Mintzberg's definition of strategic thinking as seeing. And one thing I'd like you to walk away with today is a new way of thinking about thinking, how you think. And the second tool is really how you think about time. And part of Part of um, thinking about time is being really good at transition management, horizon two issues. And I think if you don't think about what comes next and then before what you want to achieve in the long term, you've probably did a, done a, a bit of a disservice um, because we tend to get short termitis when we're dealing with political masters. It's really easy in government, isn't it? to get that short-term thinking. Here's what we'll do, and here's the re reaction we have to manage. We well, have to move beyond that. And I think the third thing I want to talk about is this new skill. Um, the study came out in September 2013. And what I found interesting is this study, um, and you can just type in political astuteness on any search engine. I didn't use Google, I think somebody said this morning. Um, I, I want you to think about, this is, was one of the most, and, and first ever studies done where they consulted actual public servants at the APS 6 to EL2 level. And they did it in three countries, in Ireland, the United Kingdom, and Australia. And so if you type in political astuteness with the name Hartley, H-A-R-T-L-E-Y, you can actually download the whole study. But this is what the thinking skills that public servants at that level thought they loved, or that they needed to excel at and maybe weren't doing so well. So it was a long-term study, uh, um, and, and the first ever study, remember we have 
had the expression political <laughs> accident or political mess for a long time. How do I get things through this really cumbersome organization and larger organization? I, were the three similar? Yes, there was a huge overlap. And, and, and that was an interesting thing about this study. Um, and I'm gonna, I, the, the most interesting thing to me about this study is people at the APS 6 to EL2 level said they learned this skill most by making mistakes. So it's about culture, it's about failure tolerance. Um, and, and I'll come back to the second and third way they learned. So they talked about personal skills. That's just an awareness. Like I know I'm not a really good detail person and I should be. So whenever I built a team, and I had a team in the pub when I was a public servant, I made sure I had somebody who covered my ass and was a detail person. The second is your ability to deal with people, which we've talked about a few times today. Reading people in situations, that was sort of the peer gossip, you know, like he could just tell where somebody was coming from and he didn't take need to take a lot of notes. And my shorthand for reading people in situations is always, do I know where they're willing to compromise? Building alignment and alliances, I don't think that's anything we haven't said. And then strategic direction and scanning, which is what direction are we taking? Or is every task and I do an activity I do consistent with the direction we're taking? How do I understand that general direction in a sense that I can apply it at my desk? And then, of course, scanning, which is a formal name for this body of change, really. And um, I thought it was a really fascinating study. And I hope I put in the next slide. Oops. I thought I had put in where people thought. <laughs> where people thought they would, um, they learned political astuteness. And, and what's interesting about this, this might be added to the integrated leadership system requirements for promotion in the next year or so. Um, so as I recall, the, the top one was learning from your own mistakes. The second one was being mentored. And the third and fourth were learning from a bad manager and learning from a good manager. So learning by example. And um, being put in, the fifth one was being put in different activities and tasks than you would normally do. So you know, you put stick up your hand when something odd comes along to do, or something difficult that nobody else wants to do. Um, and I just thought it was a, an interesting thing. Um, so you can see what I've been trying to do today is talk about my own personal experience, kind of relate it to the theory, relate it to a couple of tools you might use, and then talk about um, how you might think differently in all of those contexts. And here's, um, here's kind of my key points, I guess, from the presentation. How am I doing for time? I probably have yeah, fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> we can develop habits that allow us to see what is and what could be. I believe that sincerely. I think everybody from the APS 6 level on up um, is should be obligated to, to think about what could be. Um, we can and we need to practice kindly challenging beliefs that everybody takes for granted. And one little tip, what hasn't changed in your area for three to five years? That's probably where you're taking some things for granted. And then this idea of being anticipate, um, anticipatory, seeing emerging trends or discontinuities. And I always say, focus on what's already changing and then focus on what might change if you have the time. But we see the seeds of change in Horizon One all the time. You know, those little things that are ticking over. And a few of the earlier speakers um, talked about that, like the use of social media in procurement. How will that blossom out to the use of social media and other contexts? And then focused on what's perplexing you or surprising or disconcerting. And do that little test. Should you have seen that before? Should it have been surprising or disconcerting? So 
Those were kind of the viewpoints that I had. I'm not sure if it made much sense, but I thought I did when I put it together. But what I was trying to do was to talk about a different way of thinking, because that's what my passion really is, is that I'm, I really want you to think about the individual skills that innovators need, and I think a really special skill they need is a different way of looking at the world. And you can cultivate that and develop it yourself. Even if you aren't given professional training, there are some kind of easy things you can do. You can ask Rosalind Torres' questions, you can practice using three horizon thinking, or you can think about things for yourself. 